Dark Souls means a lot of different things to people, and everyone gets something slightly different out of the overall experience. People have the freedom and flexibility to enjoy the game in a variety of ways, but the common thread that unites us all in all of these experiences together, it, beyond it being seemingly really hard and all of us dying more times than we can physically count, is the feeling of effort followed by reward, the risk and payoff, the fear of being trapped and being absolutely hopeless, and then the elation when you finally find safety, the feeling of accomplishment when you beat a boss that was holding you down, and the feeling of all of your hard work to get better genuinely paying off. What Dark Souls 1 manages to accomplish is nothing short of a miracle. The game is a work of art made real and tangible. With that said, it does have some real flaws and imperfections that cannot be ignored. In fact, I think Dark Souls 1 gets many things right, and the good far outweighs the bad, but some of its blemishes are quite glaring and obvious, and unfortunately do not age all that well, but art doesn't need to be perfect in order to be beautiful, and I think Dark Souls 1 is a beautifully flawed game as an entire experience. Whether Dark Souls 1 was your personal first exposure to the Soul series or just, you know, FromSoft games in general, I really think it's going to provide you with quite a unique experience, and that even holds up and is still true in modern day. While each Souls game is unique in their own little ways, I think Dark Souls 1 has a very specific type of unique that plays on your emotions and your risk-reward decision-making in a way that almost no other game is quite able to do in the exact same way. Even future iterations of Dark Souls games don't quite grasp that same level and emphasis of that fear-reward back and forth that DS1 does so well, I'd argue. I would make the case that some of those would-be future titles are actually better suited for other types of gameplay challenges and obstacles to overcome that make those more enjoyable in their respective ways, but something DS1 undeniably does so well is its ability to instill tension and real fear of loss into your very soul to eventually have a heavenly payoff when you learn a boss or when you find a bonfire shortcut after being in the trenches for hours and hours. The lows are really low and the highs are quite high. Again, every Souls game is built on this, but DS1 keeps this in the foreground most apparently in my eyes. The relative scarcity of bonfires in DS1 is a prime example of this. Yes, it's also a key for how much a, a lot of the level design works, but it also serves the function of making it so that you treat your life as a much more precious commodity. I mean, you know, practically the thing that Dark Souls is known for is that how much you'll be dying a lot, and it's always punishing to die in a FromSoft game, but particularly in DS1, souls are your only means of progression and they are your lifeblood. Without them, you're nothing. I mean, there's entire areas of the game that have no bonfires at all, making you move a lot more carefully and with caution around each and every corner. This does have its drawbacks though, which we'll talk about later. Like even after defeating a boss, you know, typically in these more modern modern games, we're used to getting a bonfire location after said boss is dead, but that is not the case here. You're not guaranteed an immediate bonfire after beating a boss, and in some cases I think it works, and in other cases I think it's actually a detriment to the game. But the point is, in some sense, I can really appreciate the fact that your life really does matter in DS1 and that you treat everything with the utmost caution, and although you will be parting with your life a lot, it's not a kind of death that takes all the wind out of your sales and just makes you want to give up on the game entirely exactly. You know what kinds of games I'm talking about where you've been playing for a while and you've got all this stuff but you die and you lose it on. you're just like, I'm just like done with it. You may even uninstall the game. Dying in Dark Souls is the exact opposite. You feel almost more motivated. The game picks you back up and says, dust yourself off, run that shit back and do it better this time. And if you don't have any souls, if you're doing an area or trying to beat a boss, there's really no major punishment for dying. So if DS1 is your masochism simulator of choice, then you'll have plenty of opportunity to part with your life and run it back until you get where you need to be going. Dark Souls doesn't give you any free handouts, doesn't let up if the game's being too hard on you, which is why it feels personally satisfying to beat something, because it was entirely of your own skill and action, whereas, you know, many other action games in modern day have mechanics that can make it seem like you're doing a lot more than you really are. Nothing wrong with that inherently, and video games being accessible to all people, regardless of skill or prowess, deserve to have something to play, and Dark Souls ends up taking those accessibility options and baking them into the mechanics 
mechanics of the game itself. There's a lot to the core that made DS1 so incredibly refreshing to the palette, but I think its most unique feature by far is its interconnected level design. It's a linear game that manages to play so non-linear at the same time, with the perfect amount of seemingly uncharted exploration, followed up by just like this like aha moment when you finally loop back to Firelink Shrine, or when you open a door to connect the entire other side of the map. On top of that, it's got some of the coolest secrets and hidden areas that can also be accessed and that make this experience something entirely unforgettable. Unfortunately, I have to say, one of the more obvious ways in which Dark Souls 1 clearly shows its age is in its combat and its bosses. Not to imply that they are bad, it's just that DS1's combat and boss design in the year of our lord 2023 feels incredibly dated, and beyond that, it's just a, a lot more of a rigid and, and clunky and stiff, and, and not to mention the scuffed nature and polish, even that the remaster has still plagues the game to this day. And I have to say, Dark Souls 1 bosses are great, but they're not a flawless lineup or track record compared to something like Dark Souls 3, which basically doesn't miss at all when it comes to bosses. DS1 has a few examples of just like, like seriously, like what the f*** were you lads thinking? Also, in my other reviews of Souls games, which <clears throat> um, you can go uh, check out my other ones too, I usually talk about every single boss in detail. However, Dark Souls 1 has a lot of bosses that I just don't have that much to say about. A lot of them are pretty much carbon copies of each other with a few minor differences here and there. So instead of breaking down every single boss in detail, for Dark Souls 1, I'm just going to highlight the ones that I think are important and stand out for either good or bad reasons. I'm going to have a dedicated section later in the video for bosses, and I'm going to be talking about most of them, but there will be a few that I probably just skip over. But I will be making sure that I also do cover DLC bosses, so don't worry there. But then there was fire. And with fire came disparity. Upon beginning a game of Dark Souls, it opens up like basically any other game, but its tutorial area is honestly so incredibly intelligent and deliberate in what it's teaching the player. You basically get the grip of the combat mechanics and find a resting place, only to then be immediately faced with one of the game's most unexpected and threatening enemies, in which you realize you just simply aren't equipped to deal with this thing. So eventually you either die a couple times until you realize that you can find an escape route to further explore. You get hit with some unexpected expected traps and, and you know you find a real weapon it even introduces the concept of secret areas when a wall breaks open and you learn the basics of shortcuts and keys to move about levels and for all of that effort you get rewarded by finding the drop on that same boss that that felt impossible before you get a really good vantage point and now can actually take it out with a real weapon and you know some better positioning once you beat it you're feeling quite confident as you fly over to firelink shrine that is until you stumble uh, into the the catacombs and the skeletons who promptly put you back in your place and knock your ego back down to earth. Once this area of the game denies you enough, you'll go out and explore some of the other alternative paths that you have access to. You'll eventually work your way through these initial areas, slowly but surely upgrading your character and leveling as you unlock and explore the world around you. And just when you think you've gotten pretty powerful and your confidence is high, you'll cross that one particular fog wall and be met with another challenge that puts you back down to earth. In terms of just like playable space and sheer square footage of, you know, areas in Dark Souls 1, it's honestly not that big of a game, and the world is fairly small compared to basically everything else that they've made. But I mentioned how Dark Souls 1 level design is so beautifully interwoven with itself, and how it gets away with having a more scarce amount of bonfires or otherwise checkpoints than other titles do. This smaller level design is not exactly a detriment, though. It manages to feel unbelievably expansive, despite not being a terribly large map, technically speaking. This gives DS1 its genius level design and progression path, not to mention probably saved huge time and money on not having to develop a bunch more areas and set pieces in the game. All of that on top of, it gets to have the added benefit where you have a lot of those oh sh** moments and you know when you realize that you know the undead bird connects down to firelink seeing the new londo ruins connect to the valley of the drakes realizing that the tail end of blight town actually comes out the other side to the valley of the drakes and then back to firelink 
All of these moments don't come without real effort though. You have to explore really carefully in the catacombs or in the sewers and painstakingly link every little shortcut and such. It's always some real effort and fear followed by a reward. While I cannot honestly look you in the eye and tell you that Dark Souls 1 is my favorite FromSoft game ever, its interconnectedness and really deliberate level design, especially in the first half of the game, are absolutely immaculate. The amount of thought and attention to detail as it relates to rewarding the player with a shortcut or a bonfire or just, you know, the way that you, you feel as if your actions matter is absolutely unmatched by anything else in the Soul series. Wow! And it's what makes for some of the most heart-pounding moments that are, you know, completely detached from the boss fights themselves. However, this level design does fall apart a lot in the late game of Dark Souls 1, sadly. And the late game begins to feel a lot more strung along and half-baked compared to how dialed in and meticulous it was in about the first half or so. On the topic of progression, another huge weak point of DS1 has is actually that it hard locks you into committing to one kind of build period, that on top of the fact that some of the stats are just kind of strange. I'm, I'm looking at you, Resistance. But yeah, no, seriously, like, more so, you know, committing to one kind of build, it funnels you, and you actually really have to commit to one particular weapon, and, and that's because the resources for upgrading gear are incredibly scarce, which is fine in and of itself, but it means that experimentation becomes quite expensive on how powerful you could theoretically be if you just committed to one weapon. And to make matters worse, the really arbitrary and obtuse nature of the, you know, upgrading menus themselves and the clunkier UI don't help at all. They are so obtuse when it, com when it comes to explaining how stuff works, whether you're upgrading or repairing weapons or armor or how to upgrade something further if you have the materials for it and so on isn't always obvious. There's a ton of quality of life improvements that Dark Souls would eventually receive, but DS1 would unfortunately not quite benefit from them. For example, you guys know that Firelink Shrine just in general is like your central hub. You're going to be visiting there a lot and it's pretty like integral, I would say, to the overall structure of, you know, Know, interacting with the game and getting around and stuff like that. But your Firelink Shrine in DS1 can be permanently inactive if you accidentally use the Firekeeper Soul to reinforce your Estus instead of returning it to her. This is a very common mistake to make that permanently makes your game more inconvenient or the fact that humanity is required to fully kindle the flames. I don't even hate this idea, it's just that like the mechanic itself takes so long and can feel incredibly time-wasty and clunky and just tedious to do, and a lot of this could be really tightened up. Rolling over 25% is so bad feeling, I mean, you can only roll in four directions, period. Uh, it's got a very terribly paced late game, armor and weapon durability annoyances, and so on. This part of the game is undeniably in need of some polish, which thankfully FromSoft would eventually straighten out. But the point is, as much as I love Dark Souls 1, it does have some clear holes and shortcomings when it comes to its level design, uh, combat progression, and just overall game choices. Like, can we all agree on the fact that Dark Souls 1 has some downright ob noxious level bits as well. I'm totally for Dark Souls and its oppressive environments. It's part of what makes it challenging and fun, but there's a really fine line between a good challenge and being downright unfair and tedious. The beams in An Orlando, as well as the silver archers there, the tomb of the giants and that stupid ass layout with no easy way to backtrack and so on. In my opinion, it does go too far in a few places where it just feels cruel without the proper proportionate reward to match it but only on occasion, and it certainly doesn't represent the broader game design for the most part. In the first half of the game approximately in DS1, you are not able to warp or fast travel to bonfires, and even when you can, not every bonfire can be teleported to. This works in the early game because it does encourage you to revisit the interconnected areas that now you've opened up the map, and it gives you a chance to, you know, f tangibly see how much more powerful you've gotten. However, it can also be just downright tedious to get back to some areas or bosses since you can't teleport to the closest bonfire directly. The routings to bosses can be pretty scuffed, honestly. I think FromSoft eventually realized that they want to minimize
minimize the time that players spend mindlessly running back and forth to a spot to engage the bosses and, and more so to spend the time you know actually engaging with the content which is why routes to bosses have become shorter and shorter i think ds1 really struggles here i think some of the boss routes are truly the definition of time wasting tedious and just being a chore i mean like like actually what the f is going on here the run back time on a few of these fights is more time than the actual fight itself takes a lot of the time it's insane and that's the case for many of the boss encounters in ds1 this also plays into one of the biggest strengths and weaknesses of dark souls and that is how widely an experience with a certain section or boss can vary from player to player or even playthrough to playthrough because dark souls 1 is a non-linear linear game you can technically choose to do almost any area you want in any order however depending on how you tackle it personally it will make it so that you may have a very much easier or harder time depending on which routes and order you took because it's so open-ended you might actually over or under prepare and level for a boss where you know someone may have did that did that one first or last it's so smart the way everything's woven and connected but it doesn't allow for a really tuned experience that some other FromSoft games capture Dark Souls 3 for example isn't exactly linear but it's way more linear than ds1 and you can criticize dark souls 3 for being a, li a little bit more linear but it has the added benefit of it makes it easier to curate how powerful a player should or should not be by the time they get to said boss it just lacks some fine tuning and consistency in ds1 which again is a strength and a weakness this is a bit of an issue in the first half of the game and downright crumbles in the late game but still as a whole i would say the masterpiece that is the first half of Dark Souls 1, in concert with its beautiful set pieces and obstacles, far make up for the shortcomings it most certainly does have. Now, the next thing I do want to touch on is combat. I mean, to put it delicately, Dark Souls 1 combat is certainly much more basic, vanilla, rigid, and a little bit slow than we're probably accustomed to at this point. Once again, that doesn't necessarily mean it's bad at all. In fact, it's still really solid at its core. It's just clearly lacking in things that make Dark Souls combat feel so damn good. Like, it's not as sexy or flashy or quick as some of the newer games, and there's really no interesting offensive combo inputs. You've just got your basic light, heavy attack, and kick, plus like whatever spells or magic you want to use. You can only roll in four directions, period, and bosses themselves have a very limited moveset, and the combat pace is far slower than in more modern games. It sounds funny to say, but Dark Souls 1 is really almost like a turn-based combat system. Not literally, but it, it's it's really clearly like attack or wait for enemy to attack and then respond and or whiff punish. Rinse and repeat. That's like the entire combat loop, which, you know, all Dark Souls combat more or less is like that at its core, but DS1 more than any other has that slow pace to its combat where it's the most apparent and obvious. There's like a very hard line between your turn and then the enemy turn. It's like there's a bunch of things that you can tell are, are very clearly like quality of life changes that would just make the combat fluid and, and more responsive. Like, like it just feels incredibly clunky when not being able to move at all when using Estus or being stuck in any other slow ass animation. I can't fault its combat too much though because the core fundamentals are still intact it's just a much slower you know bait out moves and whiff punish play style than I personally prefer on the bright side there are a few bosses who make this game's combat really shine but some do not gel well with what it's going for too well either but despite having you know more dated stiff basic and rigid feeling combat it's still a super fun system to engage with and it, it makes bosses and regular enemies encounter is really fun to chew through and through the game's variety of areas. Also, if you're someone who gravitates towards using magic-based builds, the blue mana bar from Demon Souls is gone and wouldn't reappear until Dark Souls 3. So now you have to work with a hard set number of spells, no questions asked. It's not my favorite iteration of Souls combat systems, but like I said, its bones and DNA are all still there, but that's really all it is at the end of the day at this point is kind of just bones. The entire 
entire area of Firelink Shrine and its design here is also quite special, and it feels like Firelink Shrine was made for Dark Souls 1 specifically. I know that sounds kind of weird and obvious, but I guess just like the central hub world in other Dark Souls games just isn't quite as well like dialed in as I think DS1 is. When it comes to secrets that you can discover, you know, just underneath the surface, so to speak, or the NPC quest lines, this is why the interconnected design works as well as it does. You'll inevitably re be revisiting a lot of these areas multiple times over, giving you huge opportunities to do tasks for all these NPCs or run into them where in a more forward-moving linear game, you may just forget entirely or never really have the opportunity to go back there and complete it. Even though it's laid out well and bonfire placements are really meticulous, it isn't exactly seamless, and not to mention the DLC, because it can't really be baked into the core world at all. It ends up playing much more like a Dark Souls 3 linear style of level layout, which isn't a bad thing exactly, it just doesn't really feel like it's connected to the rest of Dark Souls 1 all that much. This means Firelink is a central hub that you'll inevitably be seeing a lot, but all of its functions can't be utilized until quite late in the game. But all things considered, I really do enjoy how nicely it is integrated with the larger world. Now, of course, we know Dark Souls originally came out over a decade ago, and it's been remastered in 2018. And between these two games, the visuals and aesthetics and set pieces, world design and music, sounds, etc. are really one and the same. But while DS1 doesn't really have the widest variety of visuals and level layouts, the ones it does have are pretty damn good when it comes to stuff like atmosphere and tone specifically. In fact, what's sort of interesting is that when it comes to audio and like other music, I mean, if you've played it, you'll know that Dark Souls 1 is fairly silent. You've got some music here and there, and like, especially when you're walking through Firelink, for example, that really stands out amongst the rest of the world, and it really makes it feel like a safe haven, because many of the other areas just don't have anything going on. But otherwise, it's just ambience, and you, and the world, and your thoughts which was probably both a deliberate design choice as well as a budgetary benefit. While every game, you know, forward would feature a lot more music tracks and just overall sound design, DS1 remains eerily quiet for a majority of the game and only uses music when it really counts, like in boss encounters. Just the simple act of not using music isn't necessarily a positive. Like, on occasion, I think the silence is the most piercing thing in Dark Souls. It's incredible and it really adds some tension and atmosphere to the game. But other times, I think it just makes the game feel unfinished, especially in the late game in some particular areas that shouldn't be so quiet. I think it makes the game feel very, like, unpolished and this clearly isn't done. Really, the only alternative to this is to have a constant looping background music that is just, you know, so incredibly standard nowadays, and it, it's just a personal preference thing, and while again, I can really appreciate the silence at points, it does also make the game feel unfinished in a lot of ways too, especially when you consider the more sloppy and unpolished late game experience, but it doesn't hurt the overall game too much at all. I don't dock that many points from it. The color palette is not my favorite thing either. I mean, the remaster is pretty faithful to the original game when it comes to, like, color tones and art direction and just the look of the game, but the more drab and dreary colorless environments aren't really my cup of tea personally. I gave big praise to DS3 for having the drab gray and brown environments, but also being heavily contrasted with the orange glowing embers or the beautiful sky boxes, etc. The use of color is tasteful and adds some visual spice to an otherwise somewhat bland looking game, and I feel that Dark Souls 1 just doesn't quite have that. But even with that in mind, I do still feel like it has a solid identity and look that makes it special in its own ways despite all of its technical limitations. I think beyond all of these really smart and intelligent, just good game design choices, uh, one of the things that makes Dark Souls so incredibly special, the from soft magic that people talk about all the time, is the fact that they seemingly give you very little to work with, and then you cross that fog wall, and then they're like, Okay, kill God. But the heart of Dark Souls has always been about overcoming extreme obstacles and challenges, even when it feels like in, it's impossible, without being given any guidance or help from the game. It's all you and your actions that determine whether you succeed or fail in the matter. The game beats you down, but also boosts your confidence and celebrates your victories when you are successful in achieving something great, which is why the bosses in this game have become so iconic. Once again, not the strongest lineup of bosses we've ever seen, 
seen, and some are quite unremarkable or bland, but I think it's worth discussing some of the standout ones in detail, so let's get into bosses and their impact on the experience of Dark Souls 1. The thing about Dark Souls 1 bosses, whether it's for just because of how dated the game is, or because this is genuinely what happened as a result of their dev cycle being a little bit rushed, a lot of these bosses end, end up being really interesting concepts, rather than something that feels like it's a fully finished and fleshed out, dialed in product, and it's kind of a big problem. A lot of the early game bosses don't suffer from this too much, but the late game bosses certainly do. Now, when it comes to DLC, these bosses are... I think undeniably some of the best in the game. But I can't lie, Dark Souls 1 has some pretty dramatic ups and downs when it comes to boss quality and such, and even a lot of the bosses that get copy-pasted, there is a lot of that going on here, let's just say that. <laughs> But to begin, however, the first boss that you are going to fight in the tutorial area is the Asylum Demon, and I think this is a completely fine tutorial boss, because it shows you that you're not all powerful in this game. You're going to come in with the broken sword hilt and deal next to no damage until you realize that, again, you need to escape through the door. Once you actually get a real weapon and initiate a plunging attack, you get massive damage, and then this fight becomes, you know, a lot more palatable to what you would expect a boss fight to be. It's not quite as satisfying, I think, as it could be when defeating this Thing, and its moveset isn't the the like the most varied thing ever. There are other versions of this demon that do have a fully fleshed out moveset, but this one is pretty basic. It's by no means my favorite example of a tutorial boss for the introduction, but I think it being a capstone to how smart the rest of the tutorial area is, it gets away with being, you know, slightly more vanilla and basic and bland when it comes to its actual encounter, but it's fine for what it is, and you will see variants of it later on. Now, as mentioned earlier, because of the non-linear linear design, you may encounter bosses in a slightly different order, but for the most part in the early game, a player is either going to encounter the Capra Demon or the Taurus Demon next, most likely the Taurus Demon. Again, this has the same uh, idea, I suppose, as the plunging attack for the Asylum Demon that it teaches you, but if you choose to not engage with that mechanic, then you're on this like really skinny design of an area that makes the camera feel incredibly jank, and with how big this enemy is, it just feels a little sloppy. Uh, of course, you're clearly supposed to do the plunging attack, but even if you don't, it's still completely doable. It just doesn't feel as quite, you know, finely crafted as the encounter with the uh, uh, the Asylum Demon did. However, after the Taurus Demon, you'll probably fight the Capra Demon, which again, kind of same idea, but not really. It's an incredibly small space with other dogs in it that are insanely annoying. You can sort of drop down from this, but also not really. And not to mention, the route to get to this fight is an absolute nightmare, and I just don't really think this one was quite as thought through as well as maybe they expected. It's one of my least favorite fights in the game, period. And on top of that, they reuse the Capra Demon as a normal enemy pretty late in the game, so it just makes this feel and counter feel incredibly chore-like, and I'm not a big fan of the arena, the design, or the Taurus Demon, you know, in the previous encounter. Neither of these fights really do it for me. I think the first fight that I really enjoyed in Dark Dark Souls 1 is the Bell Gargoyles, and which is strange because on paper, I feel like this is a fight that's so easy to get wrong. This, the, like, uh, in theory, it's a fight that I would absolutely hate. You know, you've got a flying enemy, you have two enemies going on at once, you've got, you know, more than one thing to deal with, and some of its moves can feel, you know, a little wonky at times, but the execution of this fight is really where the sauce is. This is where the magic happens. It's nice because even though their moves are pretty strong and they're not necessarily slow, they aren't the most aggressive enemy in the game either, and they have have a lot of animations that will, you know, lock them into place for a long period of time, giving you plenty of opportunity to fight the other one, maybe, you know, do some tail cutting to get weapons, and also telling you that, hey, tail cutting is, is a mechanic in the game that can grant you weapons and such, but I think this fight is really straightforward and pretty excellent. My only minor gripe with this fight is I wish the surface area of the roof was slightly larger to allow you to maneuver a bit more and have a bit more creative play if you're baiting out attacks and stuff. It just gets a little cluttered up here and sometimes prevents you from, you know, getting around an enemy, even if you get like a really hard read, you just can't do much about it. So I think the environment is actually the only thing holding it back. Next boss I really want to talk about is Moonlight Butterfly, which is the prime example. This is like a case study of a boss that is a pure concept without really being a final thing. Moonlight Butterfly has an interesting idea where, you know, it sort of flies around this really skinny arena and you can only deal damage to it with slight vulnerability windows when it lands to do a thing. 
uh, unless you're using a magic build or if you're throwing stuff at it, you can deal damage as it's flying around. But it also has a very, very limited move set, and it's just this like slow paced fight where you're just waiting around most of the time. There's no actual, you know, real active engagement with the boss besides the occasional dodge here and there, and then going up to damage it when it becomes vulnerable. There's no way to trigger its vulnerability either. You kind of just have to pray and wait. Not the biggest fan at all of Moonlight Butterfly. It is optional, so I can't really complain too much, but it, again, it just doesn't feel like this was thought through all that well. It maybe shouldn't even be in the game because it just doesn't, it, like, it feels like you're playing a beta build of a boss or just like a, 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 you know, a version one. It's just not really that fun in my opinion. Up next is the most sad fight in the game, who is everyone's favorite pup, the best, the bestest dog. And it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's an under is just trying to protect their master's grave and it also becomes really sad when you get this boss pretty low health and starts stumbling all over the place and stuff it's 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 a fight you don't even want to finish but as far as its mechanics go it's not the most interesting thing in the game it's pretty easy i would say but it's just like kind of one-dimensional mechanically pretty straightforward and there isn't really much to break down with this one but it's okay because the dog is safe in the little magic ring in the thing so we're good now as if blight town wasn't insane enough and running across this entire entire poison lake wasn't, you know, brutal too much, uh, then you are faced with the capstone, which is Chaos Witch Quaylog. And I would say for me, it's not my favorite fight in the game, but it's pretty damn high tier still, and if you're down bad as hell, it'll probably be top tier for you. What I really enjoy about this fight is a few things. It has those properties of like a more area of effect attack kind of slower paced creature, like the bottom half of the actual like spider, but then you have the more fast paced moment to moment kind of action with the witch herself and her sword the also the arena that you're in really does complement the move set as well because it, you have a lot of square footage to work with and part of its attack with the actual spider is that it can you know lay these lava pits around the ground and kind of deny some of the area so you need a lot of space to work with for this fight to be fair and fun and thankfully it really does manage that but what i appreciate most about this fight is that all of its moves yes they are brutal and pretty insane but they're all hella reactable and have these telegraph signs that something is coming so for example when the spider actually does spew lava she like taps on its head to initiate that when she's about to do her stab move with the sword you can see it wind up very clearly and you know start cooking i think this is a really solid fight that isn't just a concept it feels like a fully fleshed out idea and it's a you know hybrid model that i think you know fromsoft really hasn't done too much to the same extent as this one did i think this is probably the best example of you know a fight like this done well but the thing that sucks and is inexcusable is the fact that you pretty much have to take poison damage when coming into this and routing to the fight which again this is probably the weakest point of dark souls as it relates to bosses is the routes to get them are honestly bullshit a lot of the time either you take force damage or you know you have to eat poison or, or something like that and you need items to make sure that you're healed before you get into the thing so i'm not a huge fan of that but this one is fine just the worst part of it is literally the route the fight itself though is excellent the next boss i think worth discussing is the gaping dragon and for as much much as I love the introduction and setup of this fight, I cannot honestly sit here and tell you that I enjoy this one. This is one of my least favorite fights in the game, even though I can admit fully that it's a objectively well-designed fight. I just don't personally find this one enjoyable. It's pretty slow paced and really the only things going on is that, you know, you want to bait out things to punish them. The tail can of course be broken in order to obtain an item and it also negates one of its most powerful moves and it, it takes different amounts of damage depending on where you hit it. But honestly, I, I don't know what it is. I just don't really have fun with this one. I don't think it's a bad fight in any objective, you know, way, shape, or form. It's just not really my cup of tea. It's, it is what it is. It, it exists in the game. I just don't really enjoy playing it. If you're in the catacombs, you're probably going to eventually stumble across Pinwheel, and I'm not exactly sure if this fight is supposed to be a meme or not, and there is almost nothing to say about it exactly. It seems like ridiculously easy, and I don't I don't really know if that was the point, but it, again, it's not really the highlight of this area themselves. If you do somehow make it through the Tomb of Giants and you come across Gravelord Nido, this one is certainly better than Pinwheel, but I would say is a pretty mediocre fight in the game. Good idea in 
in terms of having minions running around this area and you can actually access this playable space through a uh, a secret coffin earlier in the game but Nido himself doesn't have as much going on as I would like to in order for this fight to be interesting I don't know how like resilient the minions are in terms of how long it takes for them to get back up I understand they have to be because Nido himself can kind of kill these off and maybe you can use that to your advantage and I understand their approach to this I just don't think it really plays as well as maybe they hoped it would I do want to give a bit of a shout out to the stray demon who then becomes later demon fire sage which I will not be talking about because these are a copy paste of one another which you know unfortunately is where Dark Souls 1 clearly shows its uh, lack of budget and or time and but this demon as far as its actual moveset is concerned is pretty fun again this is a more fleshed out version of the tutorial boss which you know feels like it was curated for that part of the level just because it's the tutorial boss doesn't mean it's easy I would actually say it's on the slightly more difficult tier of bosses uh, and, until you figure it out it has very devastating moves but fairly reactable ones at that Next up, I think Iron Golem is one of the most disappointing bosses in the game, and I don't even know if its introduction, I would say, is all that exciting. So this boss can be staggered and then knocked over, which, again, I'm not entirely sure if they built this level so that it can be knocked over and just fall off the cliff so you immediately win, or if it's just so you can deal a lot of damage. I don't know. This fight just doesn't seem to be as, you know, well articulated as maybe they thought it was. Some of its moves are really jank and just aren't really fun to play against it's just not a very remarkable fight no matter which way you slice it if you end up taking a slight detour over to the secret painted world you'll probably eventually encounter crossbreed Priscilla and I don't really have much to say about this fight other than this is like version one of what they would do with sister Frida in Dark Souls 3 this boss is invisible at first and you don't even have to fight her unless you engage first she's quite easy to kill and not that aggressive there just isn't a whole lot going on here but it seems like like this was the basic idea that would eventually become a really solid fight later in Dark Souls 3. Another optional boss is a fairly interesting idea. Once again, you know, you're in this like almost near infinite hallway. It's not quite infinite, but it feels like it a lot of the time, and that's kind of how it's supposed to be. But you chase Gwendolyn down to deal damage at different stages while just dodging attacks. It's one of those things that, you know, you can't really do too fast no matter which way you slice it. You have to be pretty patient with this. It's just not, you know, particularly a engaging boss and they haven't really like tried this idea very much in the future which maybe for good reason it just doesn't really work that well here but I appreciate them experimenting with something like this the track record of the mid-game bosses really sags in the middle until you get to what I would really classify as like the end of the mid-game bosses that sort of leads into late game. This is Ornstein and Smo, and my god chat, this is what it's all been about. This is the fight that Godskin Duo wish they could be, but they just ain't saucy like that. Also, this fight has basically two paths it can go. Depending on which one you kill first, the, the other will absorb the dead one's power, and so this can play differently depending on what you choose to do in this fight. It's got two alternate paths that's a lot of fun there's maybe a few moves on either character that I don't love but man for the most part this fight is absolutely immaculate I think the soundtrack is a slapper the atmosphere is great and mechanically I would say this is the best base game boss the DLC of Dark Souls 1 has really solid bosses but when it comes to base game only I and again it's it's a duo fight which is really strange but I would still say Ornstein and Smo is probably the overall best fight in base game DS1 not only is Ornstein and Smo an amazing fight to beat just based on what it is. It's so incredibly satisfying, but you also, once upon completing it, get the access to get the Lord Vessel, meaning you can now teleport between bonfires. So the reward feels absolutely worth the effort required to get it, and it allows you to move forward with the late game of the rest of Dark Souls 1. While Ornstein and Smo are required to beat the game, uh, the Four Kings is probably where I would say the actual late game begins or unlocks, and this fight, I love getting there. I like the idea of just like dropping into the abyss and not dying and then you're just in this black void fighting these things but the actual mechanics of the fight go against everything that Dark Souls 1 has established and it, it I just don't really understand why they made this choice it's basically a DPS race you have to kill them otherwise the kings can keep multiplying and eventually overwhelm you you have to basically take them out one at a time and just tank their hits it's it's not really that enjoyable as far as what you've been learning to do this entire time it doesn't feel 
like you've gotten better in a way that counts. And you know that you're meant to play this kind of way because their attacks deal significantly more damage if you're far away and trying to like, you know, outright, outright dodge them. Whereas if you're just like literally on top of them and in their face and just smacking them and tanking their hits, they can't really do a whole lot to you and you just heal whenever you're starting to get low. It's not a great fight. Uh, it's interesting, but it's, I can't even say it's that good. Next, I think Seat the Scaleless is probably the biggest missed opportunity as it relates to maybe being an interesting base game boss. I love the visuals of this. The things I hate are the route to get here. The run back is absolutely tedious as hell. And the fact that the arena itself does not feel like it fits this kind of boss. It consistently is clipping through the wall. Its hitboxes in terms of what is actually dangerous are really not clear whatsoever. But I love the way the the boss looks aesthetically it's just not really that remarkable otherwise and i think it's just a, a giant missed opportunity to do a lot of cool things with its visuals and its mechanics it's just not it and again not to mention that run back route is horrendous i said earlier in the video that i probably wasn't going to talk about every boss i mostly just mean these ones but now that i'm here you know what it. let's do this ceaseless discharge is a meme centipede demon is an unfinished mess that is insanely unfun and looks like it came from a ps2 game and demon fire sage is a reskin of stray demon but orange there and then finally we get to possibly the worst fight in a dark souls game ever or maybe one of the worst fights in video games period bed of chaos i think i would rather eat glass than run this back more than a couple of times this is the most unfun way like i i, I hardly even classify this as a boss i don't even really think it is a boss fight so to speak this is a platform segment that you're going to have to painstakingly get through hit the two sides of its thing while the floor falls out and hopefully you don't get swept in the thing it's weird because this fight kind of like i guess you know saves your progress so to speak like if you break one of the sides you don't have to completely redo it uh on subsequent runbacks it's going to take you maybe a little while to get through it's either a one and done or it's going to take you a billion years there's really no in between and you hit a thing once to deal full damage to it and then it's just dead again i use the term boss very loosely this is probably the most experimental fight or one of the most experimental fights that fromsoft has ever done i can see this being an interesting concept if it was done a lot more like cleanly and fairly and it just wasn't as jank as this one is i don't think i need to explain it more if you've played it you know how bad this can be unfortunately dark souls one really stumbles over the finish line when it comes to its bosses and this one really weighs down the batting average but finally the last boss in the game once you've beaten all these is gwyn lord of cinder and this one is okay i would even say it's good but it's not quite as like grand scale as you may expect from this which maybe is the point maybe that's fair but i i don't know i just felt incredible incredibly underwhelmed by this fight and it's also hella cheesable if you're parrying but even if you're not like it's not that difficult to beat like its moves are very very basic and, and reactable you'll probably beat it on your first try i would just say it's a little underwhelming as a final boss not even bad not even remotely bad it's a high tier fight in the game when ranking amongst the rest of the selection but as far as what it could be it's not something i i'm particularly in love with but the dlc bosses i think are a giant step up and are without a doubt the best bosses in the game you start with sanctuary guardian this is a good introduction because you have a lot of room to work with in this area it's a great like opener to the dlc itself it's not that hard of a boss and it's not super aggressive allowing you to get your bearings and kind of setting the tone for what the rest has to offer the bosses do get increasingly more difficult after this one but this is a good like confidence boost to let you know like hey you know i still got it i can take these on but they definitely crank up the difficulty and heat after you beat sanctuary guardian itself and the thing you're going to notice immediately when playing the DLC of Dark Souls 1, you know, unfortunately, the level design, like I said, is disconnected from the rest of the world, but the bosses themselves, you can tell had way more time in the oven than all of the late game bosses in the base game. And after you beat Sanctuary Guardian, this takes you to, in my opinion, the best fight in the game, period. Knight Artorius, God, it's just so chef's kiss, my guy. 
when I was talking about earlier how, you know, there's a few bosses in the game that really complement the combat pacing and style of Dark Souls 1, I think Nar Knight Artorius is the one that comes to mind most commonly. And this fight is absolutely immaculate. It's a, you know, very standard, just one-on-one, -on -one, no gimmicks. He has an interesting mechanic where he can power up if you allow him to. So if you choose to play more passive and, you know, take these moments and windows to heal yourself instead, you may let him get more powerful and risk dealing with higher punishment if, if you don't stop him. If you do stop him, you risk, you know, missing these healing windows yourself or to do other actions. So this fight is all about deciding in the moment what's best for you and your particular run. This fight is absolutely just pure sauce, and I know I say it all the time, but a fight like this, I honestly wouldn't mind if that was like every fight in the game. I know, it, you know, Dark Souls would get repetitive if every fight, you know, played similarly to this, but I really wouldn't complain. I love Knight Artorias so much, it is by far the highlight of the DLC for me, and is one of the most iconic fights in all of Dark Souls the entire series. Again, you'll really feel that rhythm that gets established in Knight Artorias' fight, and I know they reused a lot of this, like, framework and fights that have been similar to Knight Artorias in the future, and that I also think do really well. This is just a working formula that really, no matter the implementation, I'm always going to enjoy and is always going to be an excellent fight. It is one of the more difficult ones in the game, but I think it, that's completely fine because it's just so immaculately executed that I cannot help but absolutely adore it when it does come up. And then after that, you have Manus, Father of of the abyss what can i say about manis he's the goat i mean it's it's a brutal fast-paced you know devastating fight that uh, i i honestly is just as saucy as knight artorius it's a little bit less of that emphasis on one-on-one -on -one kind of moment to moment gameplay but i think it does just fine in terms of like rewarding you for playing smart understanding its threat range and good timing manis isn't even my favorite fight in the dlc but still it dumps all over anything in base game dark souls 1 maybe besides ornstein and smoke it's so good and you can tell they probably had a lot of time to really refine and perfect these fights and i think these two are really the standouts in terms of atmosphere and mechanics they are both immaculate i have a hard time deciding whether whether i really like artorius better or manis i mean they're very close to me i think i would still have to go artorius but this one is still super excellent the final fight in the dlc is the dragon calamite and i know some people take issue with this fight and again dragons aren't really my favorite kind of fight i greatly prefer something like artorius but i can completely appreciate the the understanding and experimentation of how Calamite operates in Dark Souls 1. I think it's a great blueprint fight for dragons that they've clearly iterated on in future titles. I'm not about to sit back and tell you this fight is perfect, but as far as what it does accomplish, you know, it's got a fair amount of, you know, area of effect attacks. It's got some, you know, respondable and reactable swinging moves. This fight definitely feels good to get better at, and I think that is like part of the magic that makes a good Dark Souls boss. A lot of them who don't feel better to get good at end up being pretty low tier but calamite you can actually feel yourself improving as you play and not to mention this goes for all of the dlc bosses the routes to get to them all of the run back routes are like really solid I, I nothing is particularly annoying or you know out of the way or tedious everything is fairly straightforward and getting to calamite isn't really that hard and it's exciting to run it back and learn as a whole package, the DLC, every single boss, again, takes a fat dump on anything in the base game, basically, again, besides maybe Ornstein and Smo and a few little gems here and there. But most of the base game bosses are a little inconsistent, if not sometimes outright terrible. The bosses, however, are still an integral part of what makes Dark Souls so damn good, and as an entire experience with the DLC included, you have a very good selection of bosses that are going to give you a nice challenge and a good gameplay variety that, that complements the combat system that Dark Souls does really well. Dark Souls is a game that works because it operates on so many different levels, from being just genuinely a great game and an objectively well-designed video game at that, it works psychologically on that risk-to-reward pathway that really other games aren't able to achieve the same way, and it can be played in almost an infinite number of ways for an infinite amount of challenges, and it's one of the most gracefully aged games ever made. Dark Souls was made initially just as a spin-off of Demon Souls, but this ended up being their working formula, and here is where they caught lightning in a bottle.